the Born to Be podcast, where we believe you were created on purpose and for a purpose. Each week, we deliver inspiration and interviews with today's top thought leaders who are living out their unique calling every single day. Are you ready to discover your true identity and become who you were born to be? The future is yet to be created. And now, here's your host, Darren Earlywine. Welcome back to another episode of what was the Born to Be podcast. Now is the radio theology something or other or other. We got to come up with some good names here. Uh, but thanks for downloading the episode. Thanks for being a part of the mix here in the radio theology universe. And uh, one thing I love about what we do, uh, whether it be through the radio show, the podcast, our pub theology live events here in Indianapolis, is we get a chance to meet uh, people all the time. And I am absolutely enamored by people's stories because I think it's when it, within people's stories that we get a chance to see. Uh, how creative God is in interacting uh, with our lives. And so uh, we had a live event a couple uh, weeks ago um, called uh, Worship on the Water. We do outdoor worship service here in Indianapolis at a bar. And I got a chance to meet uh, who's become a friend of ours, Greg Cooper. And Greg started telling us uh, his story. He's going to tell it to you here on the podcast. And uh, it took us about 30 seconds. We're like, you're coming on the podcast. We got to have a conversation. But Greg, you have been in broadcasting uh, in Indianapolis for years and years. Uh, you're you're doing real estate now. God's had you on a crazy journey. Uh, but um, I guess where I want to start, because I don't know how you don't start here, is is how you almost died twice in in two uh, well a plane crash yeah. and a helicopter crash. So let's start with the the juicy and then just chase this story where it goes. But welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It's great to be here. And if I have to I have to say, as opposed to being on radio theology on Sunday. I know because it's just you and I talking that there probably won't be any gentle sobbing involved. That's true. That's because true. People Le- start sobbing and I yes. get emotional and I, I reach know. for a chicken soup book and then I know. it just all goes downhill. Lisa so. Lisa is here helping us edit this episode, but we have not given her a mic, so there she will not cry on this episode. Well, she might, but we won't hear it. We won't hear it. So we should be safe. But anyway, Greg, I mean you so you were doing the story is you're doing traffic, right? right? Yes. Here in Indianapolis. And how long had you been at the job? So I'd been in the radio business 10 or 12 years, and, and I had gone to Indiana University, and I had come up here and gone to work. Uh, actually, I had worked on WZPL on 99 and a half at one point okay. for a number of months. I uh, went to work at 93.1. It was a number of different formats and stations and call letters, but one of my jobs became flying in the helicopter and doing radio traffic reports, which sounds like an incredibly cool job, and it is right up to the moment that you crash. <laughs> and then it's not so cool anymore. So before, when you, did, were you afraid of heights or flying when they asked you to do it, or you didn't really, you are fine? I am, I am by rule, afraid of heights. I'm not up on a ladder cleaning the gutters at my house because okay. I'm afraid I'm going to just go tea kettle into the carpet down okay. below. But yeah. up in the helicopter, it's kind of serene. You're, okay. you're, it looks like you're watching a movie a, right. a little bit, and so it, it doesn't feel, uh, you don't have fear. I didn't anyway. Okay. Until it started to lose power. Well, I think we'd flown, I'd probably been doing it a year and a half or two years, and we'd never had any issues. We'd flown in the most brutally cold conditions. We'd flown in thousand degree conditions, metaphorically speaking. And yeah. so it really wasn't anything that I'd ever even considered. I mean, I remember one time, and I got over it quickly, but it was a little intimidating. There was a time when we were flying, and there was a thunderstorm that had come in really quickly, and we were headed back to, to Metropolitan Airport up on the northeast side of Indianapolis, and we, we saw the lightning come under the helicopter while we were headed back. Wow. And it was an instantaneous boom to the point where you felt it push you forward in really? the air. And that was, I think, a, a moment where I had a little bit of mortality, but we kind of got over it. We were out, out of the air for weather a couple of days, and we got over it. But... That led to a kind of a complacency and a, and a comfort level. Uh, when I first started flying in the helicopter, what they did to kind of get me acclimated, as they say, they took me up to 8,000 feet. And the, and the helicopters that fly around the city and do observational work, whether it's traffic or, or land surveying or whatever it may be, they fly at 2,000 to 2,500 feet. Okay. The pilot takes me up to 8,000 feet, and he's an old Vietnam guy, and he puts it in neutral and lets it fall all the way to the ground. What? That's what, that's what they do. Because they said, we're going to teach you what's going to happen if in fact we ever lose an engine. So it's in neutral and the, and you're falling like you are from the top of the Hancock building in Chicago in the elevator. And you're watching and the ground's getting closer and and he's up there laughing because I'm my face is getting whiter and the blood's draining uh, basically out the door. Oh my god. And you gosh. get down to about 800 feet and it's still coming and he's still he's just kind of laughing away. So in a helicopter what happens is the pilot uh, through his skill when you get close to the ground they change the pitch of the blades, and that allows you to skid forward when you hit the ground. So if there's an open space to land on 
and the pilot skills are are according, and thank God they were according, then you're going to be just fine. And then as we had our little incident uh, about Pendleton Pike and 465 in Indianapolis, uh, that's exactly what happened. Only We were only at 2,500 square feet, and we were very lucky that there was an open space below us. Because if you're on top of a big building, that's where you're coming down. Wow. So how old are you when this happens? Um, 26 or 27 years old. I, I was really cocky. I didn't have a lot of humility. So I just thought, eh, whatever. So we lived. near-death experience, helicopter crash, and it's like, man, that was a close one. But no real reflection on it. No, not really. I mean, we there was no damage to the aircraft. We're down fine. Everybody's okay. And it's a Thursday afternoon, and my buddies are all going out to have a beer afterwards. So I thought life is good. I didn't really – it didn't hit me. The first one didn't hit me. The second one was a little different. So what – I guess – that moment, a near-death experience, at this point in your life and your journey, was like was faith, connection with God, was something that, that was a part of your life, a major part of your life, kind of an afterthought? Where was that at as far as a faith journey? I was raised uh, as I grew up in with a, an exposure to the Methodist Church. It was very traditional. It was a long time ago, which there was no modern-day church music. Sure. I mean, it was all how great thou art. And all the, and I love all of that stuff, but that's sure. not what everybody's cup of tea is. So I was raised with that background. And I think like probably a lot of people who go off to a big university and then get out into the real world on their own, that was probably a, a back burner in my life, the, the role of my faith at that point in time. It wasn't yeah. entirely gone. Thank goodness that flame never went out completely. Right. But I, I think it's fair to say it was not uh, preeminent on my mind at that point in time. So it wasn't like this wasn't like a near death experience. And all of a sudden it's like, I got to get it all, you know, got to get God number one. Cause I almost died. It was like, Hey, that was a crazy Thursday. Here we go. I think I thought, well, my family almost got the million dollar insurance policy. That was the first <laughs> thing when we, we were okay. I thought, well, that policy that the station bought on me, uh, fortunately they will not have to exercise that. And, and as I've said uh, to several people after it happened, uh, the second time, which, which we'll talk about, I know a little more, I got out and I went to the dry cleaners and the liquor store and the career counseling center because I decided that that was the place where I probably need to reconsider my options <laughs> after the second crash. So before we get to that one, I guess take me back a little bit into the journey is is what what led you to want to be in broadcasting to begin with? So when I was 17 years old up in Northwest Indiana, I was the student council president uh, at Crown Point High School. Okay. And I went to some a very small local radio station I went over in at some uh, public affairs program at lunchtime and was talking about homecoming or some such thing. And the owner was driving away to go to lunch and heard me and came back and said, would you like to come work on the weekends here? We need help. Hmm. He said, you have a nice voice. We can train you. And it's, you know, I'm, I'm playing beautiful music, elevator music, all of that. And so uh, it was pretty cool, except I was playing music that not one of my friends would have been caught <laughs> dead even knowing existed. Hey, tune into my show. Oh, wait, no, don't. You won't yeah, like don't, music. No, you're not going to want to hear <laughs> Tony Bennett. I mean, and I love Tony Bennett, but. Not for that moment in my life, not mm-hmm. for 17 years old. So you get that opportunity. And so is that, was it something even before that you thought about it? It was just like, well, you know what? I, you know, I do have a good voice. This could work. Let's go for it. It's fun. Hadn't dawned on me. I mean, I, you know, at that point, culturally where I was in my life, where society was broadcasting, the radio industry was very iconic. Yeah. There were very people that were bigger than life yeah. that were in the business. So we, you know, they were kind of cool, the cool kids, if you will. Uh, it had never dawned on me to be in that business. But once that opportunity presented itself, uh, I latched onto it like grim death. I was I was going to take it as far as I could, and then I, I went to Indiana University, uh, got a job there at the radio station, the commercial station there, and it kind of went from there. Wow, wow. So you you have the, 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 the helicopter crash, and that doesn't dissuade you like, I got to get out of the air or out of the industry. You, sh- you, sh- you know, schleff it off, and let's just go, let's get back to work tomorrow. So, but then you you have another brush with death, which, I mean, to you, it's your story, but like most people don't have the almost died one time moment. And then I would say the percentage is unbelievably smaller of like, well, then the second time I almost died in an, in an, an aircraft crash, like that doesn't happen. My wife, we just, you know, we just went, flew, you know, uh, last week and she hates flying. Like we had a little bit of turbulence and if there's turbulence, like she grabs onto my arm, like, you know, like, I, like my arm is going to save us from being 30,000 feet in the air. But I like to comfort her. But if if she went through your first crash, it, that's game over. See you later. I'm not doing it again. So right. so take us through uh, uh, I Almost Died Chapter 2. This was probably 8 to 10 months later, and they had taken us out of a helicopter the station had because helicopters got really expensive to fly. So they put us in a Cessna 182, which is basically an overhead wing, fixed wing aircraft. It's a prop plane, one engine. Um, and they were a little hanky taken off and landing, but for the most part, it was about as comfortable to me as it was in the helicopter. And it, 
we had flown for some period of time, months, and uh, we had gone through the procedure of what happens if you have uh, an emergency. And at one day, one late fall afternoon, we were going up I-65 from the downtown Indianapolis area, and the engine starts lurching. And it's it's banging, basically, as we're going up 65. We're probably at, I don't know, 30th Street or whatever it is. And it's banging and banging and banging. And pretty soon the pilot shuts the engine off because he said if he doesn't, we were burning a rod up inside the engine for lack of getting too deep in the weeds. But he said if I don't shut this off, I'm afraid that the engine will tear itself out of the fuselage. Uh, and if it does that, oh you go to tail first. And there's not, a lot of, there's not a lot of good things that are going to come of that. So he shuts it off. And I look up in front, and the prop is straight up and down at 520 in the afternoon on a Thursday going up I-65. And so we're looking at the interstate below us, and we're thinking, there's really not a lot of room to wedge yourself in at 114 miles an hour going down there. Uh, so he milks it and milks it and milks it, and we ultimately come in over Guyon Creek Elementary, which is about 42nd and Guyon Road. And this is probably the image that sticks in my head more than anything else maybe I ever did in broadcasting which is we came over and there was a field next to the elementary school that was a lot of scruff trees, six, seven, eight foot underbrush, things of that nature. And we came in directly over some power lines and he was going to take us into that field. And he was a hard bank to come into the field. We're literally laying on our right side as he's making that turn. And I'll never forget there was a, a fifth or sixth grade football game going on on the field below us oh as we came in. Gosh. And as we came in, they all it was in the middle of a play and they all just stopped and looked up, and you could literally see their eyes looking at us through the helmets. Uh. And I'm thinking, well, is this the last 28 seconds here that my chapter's going to be? And we went into a field full of that six- and eight-foot underbrush at about 110 miles an hour, bang, 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 on the wings until it just eventually stopped, and we didn't flip, and we didn't explode, and uh, we got through it. But that was probably a far more impactful event than the helicopter because that took about six minutes. The helicopter was over in 35 seconds. And we didn't get hurt, and we were good, and we're moving on. But the, the airplane, you have enough time to be terrorized in six minutes. Yeah. Especially when you're talking about going in tail first from 2,000 feet, and then you go in and you see all these little kids just looking up at you, and you think, surely I'm going to be on some cable news channel that night. So, so in those six minutes, from the propeller is not moving, and I'm staring at 65, yep. to – oh my gosh, we stopped. I have all of my arms and limbs and I'm not on fire. Like, are you having conversations with God in the middle? Are you just freaking out? Are you just trying to like do what you, I mean, where, where are you at in that moment? I, I didn't think about it a lot at the time. No, it was probably later. And that one did cause me a little bit more to, to look inward. It was probably 18 months to two years later, I think in total from when the first one happened. And it took long enough where it really affected you deep down inside. I mean, fear is a a pretty powerful tool, especially when it embeds itself in the pit of your stomach. And the other one, I didn't have a chance to be afraid. Sure. I was not afraid on the first one. It was it, over. It just we, happened. We blew a fuel line. We're, we're popping along in the helicopter, and all of a sudden it's dead silent except for beep, 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 which is the stall thing. And then the next thing I know, we're behind the Kmart, and we're fine at Pendleton Pike and 38th Street, and it's all good. The second one, where you're going up the interstate, and there's nowhere for you to go down, and you're just praying the pilot can find an open field, and it's going on and on and on, and you're just... That one makes you think. And yes, it definitely had a, a, a higher effect on my, my soul, if you will. Yeah. So did you, after that, did you get out of the industry then? Or was it, was it something that you thought, you know what, maybe, I mean, I know for me right now in my life, if I had two near-death experiences in a career, I would be like, okay, God, I get it. Like we, we were, we're making a change or you're trying to get my attention in some ways. But I mean, I mean, what's the journey from, from, from there? I, I absolutely got out of the airplane that day, and I got in the car, and I closed the door, and I said, okay, God, that's two. Yeah. I don't need to be reminded again. <laughs> so I did begin to give consideration to it. But, you know, imagine if you're in your late 20s and you're in a job that you love doing and you're being forced mm. out of your comfort zone yeah. by things that you don't have anything control over to, be, to consider you just got to launch yourself somewhere else, and you have no idea where that somewhere else is. And I know that there are people today that probably are listening to this yeah. who are in job situations where they might really want to be there, but the job's not going to be there for them. Yeah. And the force that we have, and, and let's be honest, that force is God pushing us yeah. to where we don't necessarily want to be, but we're going. Yeah. And that's kind of what that was for me. I don't know that I, I fully appreciated it then as fully as I do having the benefit of retrospective. Yeah. Hindsight's, you know, twenty twenty, right? You pick up so much stuff in, in the rear view. I guess... In light of that, you know, Greg, 
can you take everything you know, wisdom, faith, perspective you have now, and and go back to to yourself, you know, a week or so after that second accident. What would you have said? To, what would you say to yourself now? What did you need to hear then that, that, that you didn't, that you could tell yourself now? It's the comedian. I think it's Bill Engvall. Here's your sign. Yeah. Well, that's what I, I probably would have said to myself. Mm. Wake up and listen to this. You are being told something here. Mm. I don't know how many more powerful experiences you can have than what your, your mortality is at risk to be able to say, okay, maybe I got to give it a different thought. This path is maybe not the one I'm supposed to be on. Maybe mm. I'm supposed to be in another place. Yeah. I don't know that I understood it as deeply as I did. I mean, it, it occurred to me that maybe this was not the place I should be forever. Sure. And, and truthfully, not to get into a huge thing about broadcasting, but the, but the industry has changed so much for so many people that ultimately it, it was, I, I, it's an incredible blessing. Mm. I was forced to go someplace because I was going to have to go there eventually anyway, where uh, I don't know that I would have given it as much consideration had those events, I wouldn't have. And those events not happened, I probably would have sailed right on down the road years and years into my future yeah. without giving that consideration. What about friends and family in that in that moment? What, what uh, you know, how did your family react to, to that? You know, my family did not live in town. None of them lived in town at the time. And I don't really recall making a big effort to tell them about it. I don't <laughs> think that was a conversational topic around the Thanksgiving turkey that yeah. year. I think I kind of avoided that. Uh, it was some years later where I think had those conversations. It, it, more significantly was that the people who I worked with at the radio station, they were all deeply ingrained in what happened. Are you okay? Yeah. What are we going to do about that? That was, that was probably the most gratifying part is that everybody was intensely concerned within the radio family of that station. And that was really an uh, incredibly peace-giving moment actually, yeah. to realize that. Yeah. So what was what, what's the next step in the journey then? Where did, where did you go from there? Well, I actually began – buying some rental properties. I, I did not have a real estate license. I was in the radio business. I felt like there was something else I wanted to do. And, and actually, to back up a step, when I was doing the traffic and my job kept changing because the station kept selling and I would have different responsibilities. So I was doing traffic from 5.30 until 8.30 and from 4 to 6. Yeah. So I had this huge chasm of time in the middle of the day. And I went to the station ownership and I said, look, I'd like to try and sell. You don't have to give me anything. Just train me. Give me the phone book. Train me. Tell me how to do this. I want to do it. I want to contribute in some other way. I want to learn a new skill. Yeah. And they said, nope, can't do that. Can't have you on the air. Can't have Airtel selling anything. Mm. So that was the moment that I actually went out and started looking at rental properties. Mm. And I started buying some rental properties in the Broad Ripple area in Indianapolis. It was kind of a no-brainer. You buy a property and 28 people want to live there. Yeah. Uh, and that was the place where I began to to have an interest in in the real estate industry as a whole. That It kind of changed my whole direction and ultimately it led me away from, from being in the radio business on a day-to-day basis. I think it's interesting, Greg, because I think some people is, and I think actually most of us, is when we start to, to face and experience some type of adversity in something, I think too often we we interpret it or assume it as God's against me or out to get me or or messing with my life. Uh, I personally, what I believe, and we say it every week on the radio show, is is God's created you for purpose and on purpose. He's for you, not against you, and he's near you, not far away from you. And so if he is, and I believe he is, if he is a really good father, is he's in the midst of the adversity, you know what I mean, nudging you, directing you, guiding you to the things that are going to, if you will be responsive to it, are going to lead you uh, into good things. You know, and, and in your situation, I can, I can see that, is I think, the dangerous thing sometimes is when people begin to lose something that they love or they feel that possibly God is taking that away from them. Uh, it can lead them uh, to be mad at him or, or to be in a, a real place of bitterness. So w- when you begin to, to, to move towards that, when you begin to move towards the real estate and, and moving out of that, of the, the broadcast career, uh, did you have any, any elements of feeling bitter or, or mad at God? I, I have a couple of things about my own personal faith that I think are probably a little different than what I hear from so many other people. Number one, I don't, I don't blame God for anything. Mm. Stuff's there for a reason, mm. whatever it may be. We may not like it, but it's there for a reason. That's mm. that I don't, I don't get angry about stuff like that. Maybe that's, maybe it's a character flaw. Who knows? But I don't, I don't get angry. And I also don't believe in, in praying for things. Mm. I don't want to pray for a new car or a new house or whatever, whatever the path is, help me learn from it. Mm. That's what I need to know about what my next step has to be yeah. is these things. And there's a great line from a very old book and it's, and it goes something to the effect of 
all the people and all the events and all the moments in your life are there for a reason. Mm. What you choose to do with them is entirely up to you. Yeah. And I believe it. It's not about happening to us. It's happening for us. Yeah. Yeah. That's huge. So you get into the real estate, that begins to take off. And is that in, in that you've been in that lane really since then, right? Yeah. And I've had some really uh, amazing experiences and, and it, this will sound a little bit, uh, just apologize for it, friend. It'll sound a little bit name dropping, but uh, about 11 years ago, my partner and I had the opportunity. We were asked to help uh, which uh, a company which was named Conseco at the time, now CNO in in the central Indiana. They were taking these properties back, and it was a long story, but they took a very large property back on 116th Street that had belonged to their former CEO. Yeah, and uh, today it's owned by Forrest and Charlotte Lucas. Yeah. They took that property back, and we were the ones chosen to sell that property. Oh, it wow. took sixty-four months, mm-hmm. yeah. And that I, I, we could sit here till two o'clock uh, tomorrow, uh, from where we are, for the stories that unleashed itself for that. But that was an incredible experience. The things that came about. I've had a number of other experiences like that along the way that have just been uh, overwhelmingly deep and somewhat introspective, ultimately. So. The, the journey's been the right one, and it's been a, a wonderful one, and I wouldn't change one single bit of it at all. That's huge, Greg. I guess and this is kind of a deep question. just came to me as as you were talking there is that, like, I guess I'm seeing a – I don't know. I, I've said this before that in some ways I'd like to live a life – I'd like to live a life that somebody to maybe make a movie about or write a book about at some point, which I don't know I, – I, not that I need to be the star of it, but the idea of, like, I don't know, if we're a part of following the God who created the whole universe and he has a plan for our life, like I, I don't want to live the life that that no one would want to watch my movie. Like, well, here's Darren going to work on Monday, <laughs> right? Here's here he is coming back again. And oh, look, he's he's watching TV like riveting. Right. But but the the reality about great stories is they they contain, you know, bringing you to the brink of death stress, struggle, adversity, like we love good stories because it's someone overcoming great things. And, uh, but oftentimes I don't think any of us want to sign up for the tough stuff. Right. And so, uh, in light of that, I guess for you, like the the scene, I guess I see in in your life. And the cool thing is that, you know, you you woke up today, so God's giving you another day. So it's, the story's not over, but I could see a scene in your life where somebody is looking at it and saying, Hey Greg, like you, you know, you've had two near death experiences. Like there's, there's a reason you're still here. So as you're, as you're walking into each day and God continues to give you new, new days to live, like, do you feel like you're getting closer or honing into, okay, like why am I still here? Um, I think if you're on the right side of the dirt, you're supposed to still be here. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know that it goes any deeper than that for me. And and I, I think as I've gone through the cumulative effect of my life, and I had a major health uh, scare eight years ago. I had a heart attack, had two stents put in. Oh, wow. Um, I lived through 2008, 9, and 10 in a business where, I mean, most of us, many of us have kind of forgotten the pain of that moment, but, yeah. but that was a devastating time mm. for so many people. And frankly, the pain of that, uh, that's probably way more burdensome on my psyche than, than the events where I landed, uh, the pilots call them unscheduled landings. <laughs> they don't call them crashes because if you don't go and, and hit a tree, then yeah. if the plane's intact, it's an unscheduled. Anyway, having two unscheduled landings in aircrafts all seems like a somewhat small blip on the radar now compared to the cumulative effect of all of these things that have happened and great. And I'm grateful for all of them. I mean, they're not, they're not things I look back on and go, gee, why did that happen to me? And I, mm. and I know that's easy because I haven't had a devastating illness that was prolonged over my life or I haven't lost the most significant person in my life. I mean, people have suffered great losses and I guess if I was through that, I might feel differently, Mm. but I'm at a place where I don't see things that have happened to me that are not my perception of good as things that make me angry or bitter or resentful. I love that phrase. I think that's, that's going to be one of my takeaways is, is the unexpected landings. Yeah. For you, Life, yeah, for everybody. it is. I mean, for you, it was literal, but every single person I talk to in their life, and one of the phrases that, that I've, I've been using for years is, is experiences some kind of death of a dream. They have something in their life, whether it's a business, it's a marriage, it's, uh, it's the way they thought their life would go, a job or what, whatever it is, 
everyone, I've, I, I've never talked to someone who hasn't experienced some type of a death of a dream. And I think a way to say that is it's an unexpected landing. Right. There's danger, there's fear in it. There's, this wasn't the way it was supposed to go. You know, why am I, why am I, you know, in the middle of a, of a field, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, in a plane that could have blown up. I mean, for you, it, it, you had these literal ones, but uh, like you're saying, even the recession, uh, you know what I mean? A heart attack. You have these times where it's like, this is an unex- unexpected landing here. And um, it's in those moments. We talk about it often on the podcast is, as I believe that God is so real, he wants to meet you where you really are. And that God is so real that he's speaking to you every day in everyday type of ways. And oftentimes what I find is I think one of the reasons God has created our week and our souls to work in, uh, in, in from rest to work and then returning to rest is it's only in rest in times of stopping that we're able to actually receive revelation from God. God doesn't tend to chase us down at 100 miles an hour and scream at us. And I, and I think it's those moments, Aaron, excuse me for interrupting. I yeah. think it's those moments in those bigger moments that we have that are so abrupt yeah. that sometimes we find great joy in the smaller ones. And, mm-hmm. and quickly, if I may, an, an yeah. anecdote that probably has been more on my mind than a lot of the, the things that would probably people would perceive as being bad. Uh, a number of years ago, I had a people, uh, people, I had a couple who moved here from near San Francisco, lived their entire life outside San Francisco. And they were being forced to come to work here for a biomedical company. Um, and they'd never been out of California. They never traveled out of California, never owned a house, never did anything. And they were of Asian descent. So our language issue, I'm, my, I'm not sure if you can tell, Darren, but my Asian language thing is, my Asian vibe is not super <laughs> that's, great. That's strong. That's, that's in all due respect. <laughs> so I pick them up at the airport. We're struggling to talk to each other. I take them to the hotel. It's a Friday night. On Saturday morning, I go get them. And, um, you know, it was kind of the husband translating to me from the wife. We pull up in front of a house. Uh, in Brownsburg, and it's it's about a three hundred and fifty thousand dollar house because that was an equitable number uh, in the payment to what the rent they were paying was. And we got out of the car and we stood in the driveway, and we hadn't walked to the front door, and the wife bursts out sobbing. Hmm. She's bawling uncontrollably in the in the sidewalk on the sidewalk, fifty feet in front of this house. Now I don't know what I've done. What have I said? <laughs> have I insulted her her lineage? I mean, what what have I? And he's talking to her, and, and it literally went on for four or five minutes. And he finally looked at me, and, and I kept saying, is it okay? Is it okay? And he said, listen, he said, where we are in California, we're two hours and 15 minutes from my work where I live. I live in 1,500 square feet at $6,000 a month outside of San Francisco. And he said, what she just realized, what my wife has just realized is that for the first time ever, I'm going to get to see my three-year-old in a play at school. Wow. For the first time ever, I'm going to get to watch my sixth grader play a soccer game after school. I've never, ever done any of that. Hmm. I'm going to be 20 minutes from work in a house that would be a million three in California that is a palace to us, hmm. that's going to cost us less than what we're paying for rent in this tiny little 90 by 55 foot lot and uh, two hours and some from where I work. That moment is probably way more impactful. And the gratitude that I look back on in having that moment that's a, their lives changed mm. and I got to be a part of that. What yeah. an incredible privilege. Yeah. And just to be able to wa- stand there and witness their gratitude for what they now had and the quality of their life. And we were laughing about it later. He just said, we just thought we were coming to a big cornfield because mm. you're living outside San Francisco. You've never been to Indiana. You're probably yeah. reading and not seeing a whole lot else yeah. in terms of your, your mindset of it. But anyway, that moment was magnified by the near-death experiences, mm. if you will, and by the near misses and the, the, the unforced landings. Yes. That moment means so much more and meant so much more when it happened because I had the great privilege of having those other contrasts in my life. I love it, Greg. I love it. Listen, <clears throat> Listen we're going to hit you with the lightning round, and we're going to let you go. Uh, lightning round is very simple. We just need a book, a movie, and a band that has impacted your life. They're going to be old. Does that matter? It doesn't matter. It's your <laughs> life. I'm old, so it's going to be, it's going to, they're going to be old. But, so, but it might add for some perspective. For yeah. So, okay, all right. So, book, band, movie. Oh, I'm just supposed to fire away here, huh? Oh, yeah, it's like okay. baby. So, book is uh, Illusions by Richard Bach. It's The subtitle is The Adventures of a Reluctant Messiah. Hmm. Jesus comes back as, a, as an auto mechanic in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Really? It is a fabulous metaphorical book. If you can get it in paperback, you can get it online, whatever. Love it. It's, I've never it's heard of it. Illusions. I gotta check it out. I'm no, intrigued. It's, it's it's very cool. It, the isms in it are unbelievable. Okay. Uh, what's the other one? Band and a movie. Yep. Oh, good grief. Um, I don't. I, bands come and go, and I don't know that there's one that's been necessarily impactful. Also, I'll do this. I was just at a, a concert by a group train. Yeah. Uh, within the last two weeks, 
and they did an amazing job at touching people in the crowd. And super quickly, they have a song called When I Look to the Sky. Mm -hmm. So the lead singer, Pat, says, I wrote this song when my mom died, and I want you to hold your phone up if you've had somebody you've lost when I play this song. Mm. And everybody's holding their phone up. And I, I have a video on my Facebook page. I'm panning, and there are people sobbing wow, yeah. behind me. And he didn't do it to break everybody's heart. We connected. Yeah. He connected. People thought, oh, my gosh. So that, I think, is, is while it's front of mind for me, I love stuff like that. Yeah, he created a moment. He did. There's a connection there that people are always going to say when they hear him on the radio or wherever. Yeah. That's the connection I have. When I, I lost my so-and-so, mm. we went to that concert, and he reminded me how special they were. Wow. He threw the words of that music. Yeah. So what's the next thing? Movie. movie. Oh, boy. Okay, so this is an old one, too. Uh, I think an old movie called Grand Canyon is one that sticks in my head. I probably got 20, but that one just comes to my mind. Mm. Uh, it's, it's a book about significance in a world of insignificance, or a movie, excuse me, in Los Angeles. All these really major events happen to people, and they begin to question their faith and their marriages and their relationships with their children. And ultimately, it's about this group of people that have all of these interactions and experiences at one point, they all go to the Grand Canyon and they stare over the rim mm. and the vastness. And I think there's even a line in the movie that said, this is like staring into the face of God. Mm. And all of a sudden, all of the other challenges, all of the other unforced landings, yeah. suddenly it takes on a different perspective because they realize that it's, the is is so much bigger yeah. than those little moments in each of their lives. I love it, Greg. Good stuff, my friend. Thanks so much for being a uh, part of the show today. Uh, I love it. I'm going to think about the unforced landings for uh, a long time. If you want to stay connected to you, what's the way they can uh, stay connected through social media or whatever it be? They can find me on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash G Cooper. Uh, Twitter is at Greg Cooper. Instagram is at Greg Cooper 2019. You can find me on all those places. Phenomenal. Greg Cooper here on the uh, soon-to-be-named podcast uh, as a part of the Radio Theology uh, universe. So thanks for tuning in. Have a great day. for listening to the Born to Be podcast. We'd love to hear from you. If you've got a question for Pastor Darren, a suggestion for a future guest, or if the podcast has made an impact in your life, get in touch with us at blackbirdmission.com. And if no one else tells you today, you were made on purpose and for a purpose. God is near to you, not far from you. And God is for you, not against you. Have a great week.